Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers, seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take these out of here and stop making of my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, Zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we see the scene of the purification of the temple by our Lord Jesus Christ. He do not he does not use violence against the people to purify the temple area. If we read carefully, he never mistreated anyone with that whip out of cords he made. And if he purifies the temple, meaning I come here to purify religion from corruption. I have come here to purify the temple from corruption. I have come here to purify this sacred place from becoming a business, a marketplace. Religion, religion has, become, has become a business and I have to purify religion. This is part of my mission to bring to fulfillment religion, that is, the relationship of man with God, and the relationship with God with man. Not in the sense that God has anything to be purified of, but specifically um, that relationship of man towards God. Now, this purification of the temple, of what is sacred, begins in the human heart. Because corruption begins within us. And that is why Jesus has to be, has to die and be raised from the dead. Jesus Christ, Jesus himself, his very body, his very self has become the temple of the encounter of God with man, for us to have access to the divinity, for us to have access to communion with God, we have to ap approach Jesus because his very body, his risen body, his glorified body is the temple where the divinity resides. And that resurrection of Christ was necessary because after his resurrection, he would bestow on us his spirit, and we would become with him a temple sacred dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to the praise and glory of the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit. We needed the Holy Spirit so that our 
bodies may be purified and so God dwell in us so that others may have an encounter with God through our very lives, our very temples, our very bodies. How can we purify our temples? How can we purify our souls? How can we make of our lives, of our souls, of our bodies, a worthy dwelling place for the Holy Spirit? We heard the Ten Commandments in the first reading. I will not go through the whole Ten Commandments because that's a lot. But I will go through the three first commandments. So we can purify our relationship with God. The first commandment, and I cannot go through all the details of each commandment. I will go through some of its important elements, okay? First commandment of the law of God. I am the Lord your God. You shall not have other gods before me. The first commandment demands, demands the response of the three theological virtues, that is, faith, hope, and charity. And whenever we sin to any of these virtues, theological virtues, we're sinning against the first commandment. When we say God, when we say God, we confess a constant, unchangeable being, always the same, faithful and just, without any evil. It follows that we must necessarily accept his words and have complete faith in him and acknowledge his authority. This is the act of faith. This is what the first commandment demands from us, to have the obedience of the faith, to accept as true what God has revealed to us and to embrace it and to put it into practice. St. Paul, and this, this is what, this, what I'm reading comes all from the catechism of the Catholic Church. So you can go there and deepen on all this. St. Paul speaks of the obedience of faith as our first obligation. He shows that, no, listen to this, he shows that ignorance of God is the principle and explanation of all moral deviations. Ignorance of God. Our duty toward God is to believe in Him and to bear witness to Him. Now, there are sins that go against the act of faith. What are these sins? First sin, voluntary doubt. Voluntary doubt. What is the voluntary doubt? Voluntary doubt about the faith disregards or refuses to hold as true what God has revealed and the church proposes for belief. Do you disregard or refuse to hold as true what God has revealed to us and what the church teaches us for our salvation? Because if you do so, you're sinning against the first commandment. Go to confession. Involuntary doubt refers to hesitation in believing. There is not much responsibility when there is an involuntary doubt. Refers to hesitation in believing, difficulty in overcoming objections connected with the faith, and also anxiety arose by its obscurity. Notice this. If deliberately cultivated doubt can be can lead can lead to spiritual blindness. Oh, oh, oh. spiritual blindness. I can no longer see what is true, what is wrong, what are God's paths. I'm blind because of might. Voluntary doubt, constant voluntary doubt on the matters of faith, morals, and customs. Another grave, <clears throat> serious sin against the virtue of faith, incre incredulity, is the neglect of revealed truth or the willful refusal to assent to it. And there are other sins against the virtue of faith. For example, heresy, 
apostasy, which is the total, the total repudiation, repudiation of the Christian faith. And another big sin is schism. In the history of the church, we have seen two schisms. The schism with the Eastern Church in, two, in, in 1054, that gave um, birth to the Orthodox Church, and with Luther, that gave birth to the Protestant churches. Two grave sins against the virtue of faith. And there are many other things about the first commandment, but I'm just singling out these. Just one thing more, just in case, if you have consulted horoscopes. Horoscopes. Well, that's a sin against the first commandment. Or, or I am Gemini. I am Aquarius. I... The first commandment forbids believing in all this nonsense. Now let's go to the virtue of hope. The virtue of hope has to, we, has to do with our eternal salvation, has to do with eternal life. And there are sins against the virtue of hope. One sin against the virtue of hope, despair. Despair. By despair, man ceases to hope for his personal salvation from God. For help, in attaining, for help in attaining it, or for the forgiveness of his sins. Despair is contrary to God's goodness, to his justice, and to his mercy. Despair is a sin. When you say, well, I give up, there is no solution for my sins, I have no forgiven, forgiveness, you, have, you are committing a sin against the virtue of hope, demanded by the first commandment. And there is another sin. Presumption. Presumption. What is presumption? There are two kinds of presumption. Either man pres presumes upon his own capacities, hoping to be able to save himself without help from on high. Okay, I don't need the sacraments. I don't need prayer. I don't need the church. I don't need the community. I can save myself. That is a sin against hope, a presumption. The other kind of presum presumption he presumes upon God's, upon God's almighty power or his mercy, hoping to obtain his forgiveness without conversion and glory without merit. We are in Lent. Lent is a call to conversion. And when you say, well, God forgive me, I will go to heaven without making any effort to repent, to convert, and I will have the glory of heaven without any merit, that is a, presum a sin of presumption, a sin against the virtue of hope. Okay? These are some aspects with regard to ten command the first commandment. No, there is one more. <laughs> the, the sin against charity. The first commandment enjoins us to love God above everything and all creatures for Him and because of Him. And there are some sins against the virtue of charity. First sin, indifference. Indifference. Indifference neglects or refuses to reflect on divine charity. To reflect on divine charity. It fails to consider its prevenient goodness and denies its power. Another sin against charity, ingratitude. You know that Father Edder and I constantly preach about gratitude. A sin against charity is ingratitude. Ingratitude fails or refuses to acknowledge divine charity and to return him love for love. When you refuse to return God the love he has given you, you're being ungrateful, you're sinning against charity towards God. Listen to this. Lukewarmness. Lukewarmness is hesitation or negligence in responding to divine love. I hesitate or I neglect responding to God's love. It can imply refusal to give oneself over to the prompting of charity. 
So lukewarmness is another sin against charity. If, if you say, well, I have been dealing with this, go to confession because you have committed a sin against either faith, hope, and charity. Spiritual sloth or spiritual laziness goes so far as to refuse the joy that comes from God and to be repelled by divine goodness. And there is the last, the last sin against charity is hatred of God. What is the hatred of God? Comes from pride. Comes from pride. It is contrary to love of God, whose goodness it denies. It denies it, good, it, good, it goodness. And whom it presumes to course as the one who forbids sins and inflicts punishments. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. So, <clears throat> when I... When I curse God inwardly or outwardly because he punishes sin, inflicts punishments, I am showing some hatred, some kind of hatred of God. That is a grave sin. That is a grave sin. Second commandment. Okay, if you allow me to, right? Yeah. Second commandment. The second commandment says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The second commandment prescribes respect for the Lord's name. For the Lord's respect for the Lord's name. Respect for his name is an expression of the respect owed to the mystery of God himself and to the whole sacred reality it evokes. It implies feelings of fear and awe. And these feelings arise in your life where you are aware of God's presence in your daily life. When you know that God is constantly present in everything you do, you say. When you are aware of his presence, there is respect towards him. There is fear of God and there is awe. Notice what St. John, John Henry Newman said. Are these feelings of fear and awe Christian feelings or not? I say this, then, which I think no one can reasonably res dispute. They are the class of feelings we should have. Yes, have to an intense degree. If we literally had the sight of Almighty God, therefore, they are the class of feelings which we shall have if we realize His presence. In proportion, as we believe that He is present, we shall have them. And not to have them is not to realize, not to believe that He is present. Okay? So, to honor the name of God is to be aware that He is always present in your life and that you would act and speak according to that presence of the Almighty God. You will act and speak in respect, in fear of God, in awe, in reverence, because he's present. And then I'm going to just to mention this so I can go to the third commandment and finish the homily. Huh? The second commandment forbids the abuse of God's name. Every improper use of the names of God, Jesus Christ, but also the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints. The second commandment forbids false oaths. It rejects false oaths. It rejects perjury. What is perjury? Well, look it up in the dictionary or go to the catechism of the Catholic Church so you can know if you sin against the second commandment if you commit a perjury. And I'm just going to um, read about blasphemy because blasphemy is another sin against the second commandment. Blasphemy is directly opposed to the second commandment. It consists in uttering against God inwardly or outwardly words of hatred, reproach, or defiance. In speaking ill of God, in failing in respect toward Him in one speech, in misusing God's name. The prohibition of blasphemy extends to language against Christ's church, the saints, and sacred things. It is also blasphemous to make use of God's name to cover up criminal practices, to, re to reduce peoples to servitude, to, to torture persons, or put them to death. 
the misuse of God's name to commit a crime can provoke others to repudiate religion. That has happened in the history as well. So let's go to the third, the third commandment, I am done. Huh? But I think we need to hear this. Because if you have your children asking you, what is the, the first commandment about? And you will say, perhaps, go to Mass. But we don't, we don't really know what we are meaning when we say, uh, love God above all things. Remember to keep holy the Lord's day. The Sunday Eucharist is the foundation and confirmation of all Christian practice. For this reason, the faithful are obliged to participate in the Eucharist on days of obligation, unless excused, excused for a serious reason. For example, illness or care of infants. Yeah? I have three twins. They all have the same age. And they're little earthquakes. Huh? Well, okay, there is an excuse. Yes. Because they, or maybe there is, I want, one, one is ill, I cannot go to Mass because I have to take care of him. Yes. Or dispense by their own pastor. So Father Eric can dispense you from coming to a Sunday Mass if you request him. Those who de deliberately fail in this obligation, deliberately, deliberately fail in this obligation, commit a grave sin. And this is very important. So this, these two paragraphs I'm going to read is for you to understand very well what we, how we keep the Lord's day. On some days and other holy days of obligation, the faithful are to refrain from engaging in work or activities that hinder the worship owed to God. The joy proper of the Lord's Day, I remember that when I was younger, and it was Sunday, it was the Lord's Day, I felt so such joy for going to Mass. I was happy. And if I, if I had the opportunity to go to two Sunday Masses on Sunday, I would go. And sometimes uh, my, my, my pastor would say, Antonio, you have to go and fulfill your responsibilities at home. So go home. Huh? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. But that joy of going to sing to the Lord, to give him thanks, to worship him, to receive the Eucharist, to listen to his word, to share in the community. I would, you know, be uh, wearing elegant attire for that occasion. What do we see now? The people, most of the people, even during, some, even during winter, we might see people coming as if, as, as if they were coming to the beach. Respect to the presence of God. That's how we purify our temples. That's how we purify our relationship with God. The performance of the works of mercy and the appropriate relaxation of mind and body. Family needs or important social service can legitimately excuse from the obligation of Sunday rest. And listen to this. This is very important, especially during these times of pandemic. The faithful should see to it that legitimate excuses, I repeat, legitimate excuses do not lead to habits, habits, prejudicial to religion, family life, and health. So yes, there is a, leg a legitimate excuse for not to come to Mass because of the pandemic. But there is a risk that you may acquire the habit of not coming to Mass and you start to feel lukewarm, spiritual sloth, the sins against charity, despair, So beware, be careful, because the absence of, of, of going to Mass for so long a period is prejudicial to your spirit, to your relationship with God. And the last thing, those Christians who have leisure 
should be mindful of, of their brethren who have the same needs and the same rights, yet cannot rest from work because of poverty and misery. Sunday is traditionally consecrated by Christian piety to works of mercy and humble service to the sick, the infirm, and the elderly. Christians will also sanctify Sunday by devoting time and care to their families and relatives, often difficult to do on, on other days of the week. Yes, because you're always busy during Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Sunday is a time for reflection, silence, cultivation of the mind. Read. Read good literature. Read good spiritual books on Sundays. And meditation which furthers the growth of the Christian interior life. I remember, you know, uh, I remember um, kn knowing this, um, this man who is Catholic. He's the owner of a business. And I would talk to the, the, the employees at that place. And I would say to them, well, so I, if you're Catholics, I don't know why, why I do not see you in Mass. Like, yes, Father, we would like to go to Mass. But our boss would not allow us to go to Mass on Sunday because he wants us to work. And the boss is Catholic. The boss is Catholic. And these people, these employees, do not have the necessary rest. They cannot come to the Eucharist. What an injustice. What a sin against the Lord, especially by His own people. If you are Catholic and owe a business, make sure those people that are under your care may fulfill their duty towards the Lord. Because the Sabbath or the Sunday, the Lord's Day, is the day of our liberation. And a liberation even from the slavery of money and work. Let us pray in silence.